everyone. So great to see so many of you online and joining us tonight. So we're just going to wait to get a few more people before we get started. Fantastic to see so many of you online. This is fantastic. While we're waiting to get started, would love it if you could put in the chat bar where you're dialing in from. So London, Manchester, Scotland, where are you joining us live from tonight? So hit us up in the chat bar. Boston, London, Norwich, France, London, London, London. Hey guys. Awesome. Nottingham, London coming in hard and fast. Belfast, London, London, Los Angeles. God damn, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Great there. We've got quite an international audience. So it's so great that so many of you can join us this evening. I can still see that number going up really um, quickly. So we're just gonna wait for the last, the last ladies to join us. Hampshire, Hove, Bristol, Petersburg, Istanbul. Oh my God, Lisa, we've brought in an international audience. This is so great. We're so excited tonight to chat through with you how to get started with investing. Great, San Diego, Devon, Wiltershire. All right, well, we might get started. And, um, and as we go, uh, we can just, people can just join as they arrive. So before we get started, Lise, do you want to just take us through our disclaimer? So today we're giving um, information, not advice. So um, if you want particular um, investment advice or financial advice after this, then do seek out an independent financial advisor. We can help point you in the right direction as well um, if you want. And, and also, I know we've got quite an international audience. We're going to keep things very generic, but I'm also um, only allowed to give UK advice as well myself. So. Great. At least just checking that disclaimer's up there and you can see it all good. Yeah, we can see it. Fantastic. So my name is Molly Benjamin and I'm the founder of Ladies Finance Club in Australia and the UK. And I'm really, um, we are so excited to um, be bringing you this. Uh, I started this because I wasn't sure where to go to when it came to financial um, information. I knew I needed to know it but I found the books boring and um, for men a little bit patronizing. Um, and so I wanted to create a space where women could come together and we could talk about this stuff because it's really important. Money is something we use every single day. I mean, we spend 40 hours earning it and then we spend very little time managing it. So we wanted to give you tools, resources, a guide, so you can really feel in control of your money once and for all. Because my, um, when I first started, I was horrendous with money. I didn't know what I was spending. I, um, it made me feel very overwhelmed. And I would even get like quite upset when I had to budget. Um, I'd be like, I don't wanna do this. I don't understand it. And I would just stick my head in the sand. But really, um, I, I, had to I had to change my behavior. And since then, you know, it is so stress-free and, you know, and what we're really excited to share with you tonight is how you can also um, learn how to invest and, you know, take control of your money. And we're joined by the gorgeous Lisa, who is part of Ladies Finance Club UK. So Lisa, do you want to give us a quick intro of yourself? So my day job is that I'm a financial advisor and I work a company called Westminster Wealth. So for the last 15, 15, yeah, nearly 17 years that I've been a financial advisor, I well, really spend my day helping people who've got lots of money um, manage their money. Um, and I started blogging about money and Instagramming about money about eight or nine years ago, mainly just because I was so passionate to pass this message on to people who didn't necessarily have the millions to invest straight away, but it would help them get there. Um, I'm also the author of a book called Money Lessons, which was published by Penguin last year. Um, so hopefully I've got lots of knowledge and information that you'll all find really interesting today. And before we get started, we'd love for you to hit us up in the chat bar. Where are you when it comes to investing in your finances? Uh, are, you, are you new to this? Have you, been, um, have you invested a few times? Have you invested quite a, quite a few times? Um, I know someone's just met, said in the chat bar that they feel quite overwhelmed by it or that they're not really sure where to begin. So just hit us up with, um, with what you're feeling. Great, complete newbies, just starting, 
beginner beginner newbies so newbies this is great ah oh, you're in the right spot so just quickly at ladies finance club we've got three rules first rule is we do talk about finance so we talk about it to all the women in our lives our mothers our sisters our best friends our daughters um you know it is so important that we talk about money because it still seems such a taboo topic, doesn't it? It still seems this topic that we're not allowed to talk about and nice girls and nice women, we don't talk about money. So we've got to, um, we've got to bust that one and we've got to start talking to each other about this. Um, no more excuses. So, and I used to do this a lot. So I'm talking from experience here. Oh, I'm not good with money. Oh, I'm not a numbers person. Oh, I don't get it. Oh, it's just a bit too hard. Or oh, my partner looks after it. I don't even have to look after it. We can't use these excuses. You are the only one responsible for your money. We can't rely on uh, rich parents, winning the lotto, marrying a prince. Um, your money is your money. Um, and all the ask all the questions. Now I used to have um, no question is too blonde, but a lot of people kind of didn't like that. And I got a little bit trolled online. So I've been changing it to ask all the questions. So as mentioned, you know, we haven't learned this stuff. If we didn't learn it at school, if we didn't learn it at uni, we're not learning it in the workplace. If our parents didn't teach it to us, or if they didn't have good money behaviors, or they didn't invest, it's a great chance we've never learned about this. So it's all good. Um, and this is what we're going to do today. We're going to break this down. Okay, so why is it so important? Now we know when it comes to women and money, the stats are pretty grim and we don't want to dwell too much on this, but we do really want to establish why it's important that, you know, we learn to make our money work hard for us because we are living longer on average five years and we are earning less. Unfortunately, there is still a pay gap and we're not going to probably be able to answer all the reasons for why there is that and what we can do about it. But what we can teach you is how we personally can make our money work hard for us. So we generally will take career breaks for all the right reasons to look after our kids, our families, um, to look after elderly parents. But then we face these severe setbacks to our earning financial power and capability when we return as far as career progression, um, yep, earning potential and our pension retirement funds. Um, so we literally can't afford to ignore this stuff. And history shows that investing in the stock market offers the best returns over the long term. So we let, yeah, as mentioned, we literally can't afford to ignore this, um, ignore this stuff anymore. We need to, we need to get on top of it. Please. Yeah, I think the other point to really mention is that when we do do it, we're really, really good at it. So we don't lose our call. Cool. We know when to cut our losses. We build for the for the right time frame. So we're not after a quick win when it comes to money. And we can perhaps be more conservative. Um, Barclays Smart Investor did some research and they looked at all of their um, users and they categorized them into men and into women. Now, the average men outperform the FTSE 100 by 0.14%. However, women outperform by 1.94%. So we outperform by the men by 1.8%. And I'm gonna show you later, 1.8% doesn't sound very much, but when you compound that over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, it has a ginormous impact on your money. So when we do it, we do it well. And for me, this is one of the key ways that we're gonna be able to get rid of this gender investment gap, the gender pension gap. So if I'm not gonna give the gender pay gap, but for the investment and pension gap, I think it's the real key. Yeah, we make kick-ass investors. And there's a few myths we're going to quickly bust as well before we get started, Lisa. Yeah, so when it comes to investing, I think women tend to, if we were to stereotype, well, there's lots of research done by Fidelity, for example, into the subject. Often women don't invest because um, we like to know the whole picture. Women tend to see their money as the family's money rather than their money, whereas men would see the money as their money rather than necessarily the family's, which makes it that little bit easy to invest. So you definitely don't need loads of money to invest. Most platforms have 50, 100 pounds a month minimums. Um, you, we're not trying, because we're not trying to get rich quick, we're not trying to time the market. We're gonna talk a lot about market timing. So you don't need to know when the right time to invest is. Um, the right time to invest is now, as long as you're doing it for the medium to long term. I'm not good with numbers. You really, really don't need to be. 
investment companies are set up to do that bit for you. You just need to be doing, understand, well, understand your goals, which we're going to come to and be investing for, the, as I say, for the right reasons. Investing is hard and complicated. That really, really is not true. There are a lot of jargon in my industry. And I think we put that jargon in place, um, well, to make us feel clever. <laughs> but essentially, investing is really, really simple. And we're going to show you how that, um, um, well, with a little bit of learning and by doing the right things regularly, that investing isn't isn't going to be hard. And I would say, Molly, really, that that's probably the, one of the main key drivers for setting up the Ladies Finance Club UK um, was because we want to show that if you continually learn and you continually, we're just investing in your knowledge that um, investing will, will come a lot easier. And investing is not gambling. If you invest well and you invest invest in a well diversified portfolio, it's nothing like gambling at all. Absolutely. And I think I'm, I go to show when if I can invest and learn this, literally anyone can, because especially at school, hated maths, uh, didn't consider myself good at it. Um, yeah, thought this was all complicated and investing. And now I have a share portfolio, I invest monthly and um, I'm setting myself up for a successful financial future. So we've got a couple of principles to growing your wealth. So I want to drill this in from the very get-go. Uh, investing is for the long term. So this is not about doubling your money overnight. This is not about using Uncle Terry's barbecue tips to make um, a meal. This is not about cryptocurrency. This is about investing for the long term and it's about time in the market, not timing the market. So we're not gonna speculate when we think, oh, I reckon now's a good time to buy and now's a good time to sell. Not even the best in the world can do this. So we are certainly not gonna stand a chance at it. So we're thinking here, investing is for the long term. And we're gonna talk about goals later and why it's important that um, if you've got short-term goals, you keep those in cash. Pay yourself first and your future first. So when your paycheck hits your bank account, you should be aiming towards 15 to 20% towards your uh, medium and long-term goals. Uh, so when that money comes in, uh, depending on in Ladies Finance Club, we also have um, some ways we will show you of how you can set up your bank accounts. Um, so when the money hits your account, you put that money away first. So you've already paid yourself. Um, and you know that that is going towards your future. And also, as mentioned, look out for fees and poor performance. No one likes a bad performer, and we're going to cover that later on as well. All righty. And before we get started investing, if you got my email, you would have seen me say this. Um, you've got to pay off any bad debt. What we consider bad debt is anything with a high interest rate. So we're talking credit cards, um, buy now, pay later, like the Kalana, um, personal loans, um, because as you'll see later on, you're not going to get the returns to um, that will that will um, cross cancel um, your high interest debt. So if you've got debt, which is at you know like. What would you say, Lisa, if we got debt at 20, 25, 20, 25% and you're making a seven or 8% return, yeah. you don't have to be good at math to see that that's just not going to work. So it's and also really I think people forget their overdraft as well. Overdrafts can be hugely costly. They're sort of the silent costly debt. Yeah. So you've got to pay off that um, debt first before you get started investing. Um, if you are currently in debt, not a problem. Um, definitely stay with us for this presentation because once you get yourself out of debt, um, you can start investing for your future. Um, and also at Ladies Finance Club, um, we're going to tell you more about how you can get involved with the club and also um, what we can do to help you get out of debt there. Uh, setting up an emergency fund. So we like to call these an OMG fund because they're for those oh my God moments, um, such as, oh my God, the car broke down, or oh my God, there's a global pandemic crisis and I just lost my job. It is not for, oh my God, I want that jacket, or oh my God, shots, shots on me at 3 a.m. So emergency fund is, um, we say, start with a thousand pounds and build up to at least three to six months worth of expenses that you keep um, I always say in a separate bank account where it's hard to touch. So you're not going to be tempted. And what that money is there, it's for a rainy day. It is your safety net. Some people call these emergency funds, runaway funds, F off funds, whatever you want to call it. You need to set this up because you don't want to ever have to be forced to sell out of this, um, sell your shares if you're not ready um, to pay off um, 
some kind of debt or something that comes up. So it's really important to have that money sitting aside, just staying there. And then, Molly, of course, I saw a question that popped up. So paying off the debt that doesn't include student loan um, because student loans link to what you earn. So keep the student loan and and stick with that. But all the other debts we mentioned, except mortgage as well. Yeah, I, we don't we don't consider mortgage a, a bad debt here. Um, and yeah, and money you don't want to use in the next five years. All right, let's go, girls. <laughs> um, so it's really important to um, have your goals written down. Uh, goals are going to help you stay on track. They're going to help you um, show you when you've succeeded. Um, if you don't have goals, it's kind of like going on a journey, but not knowing what the destination is. How do you know when you have arrived? Um, so these, yeah, these will help you stay on track and they will match your own personal values. So when we're breaking down your goals, um, we say do it in a short, medium and long term. So short, anything you want to achieve in the next kind of now to five years medium five to 15 years and long-term 15 years plus. So for example, um, this ladies finance club member said she wanted to get out of credit card debt. She wanted to build an emergency fund. Her medium goal was to buy a house and her 15 year plus goal was to retire with a million quid. These are great goals, but they're not very specific. So we always say put a pound sign and a date next to your goals. Um, if you're aware of SMART goals, you know, this uh, specific, measurable, achievable, uh, oh God, a realistic, time bound, um, attainable, I think I forgot A. Um, you want to, if anything, make these time bound and measurable. So um, Beyonce says, put a ring on it. We say, put a pound sign on it. Um, so for instance, let's apply that to here and have a look at it now. So get out of credit card debt. So. I want to pay £3,500 of credit card debt by March 2020. Build an emergency fund. Build an emergency fund of 9000 by January 2023. Once you've done this, it's going to be a lot easier to break down how much you need to be saving and putting aside. For example, here, um, you can break down your bigger goals. For example, if you have... Um, a really large goal, like I want to save 50K for a house. Um, when you break that into milestones and you go, oh, hey, I only need to save 375 um, a week, that is going to be way more realistic and way more doable than thinking of this massive amount um, that you have to get to. And it's going to keep you motivated and keep you on track. And I always like to put why you want this as well, just to connect it to your emotions. Um, so, you know, why do you want to build an emergency fund? Well, I never want to have to be reliant on anyone. Um, I want to know that if something happens to me, I've got money there. I want to know if I can, if my boss becomes a bit of a, a douche, I can leave my job at any time and I've got money there. So, you know, I would also say put a why. And I mean, you can jot these down. You can create a vision board. You can put your goals on your phone. You can write them out and stick them in your wallet and keep them on you. But if you write them out regularly, you're 42% more likely to achieve them. And I think that's a, a pretty strong stat. So that is um, goals. And spoiler alert, if you have a medium or long-term goal, you might want to think about investing this money. If it's a short-term goal, we're going to leave this in cash and we're going to explain why it's important to leave that in cash. So we're going to give you a minute now um, just to have a really quick think about what are your short, medium and long-term goals. You might never have thought of this stuff before and that is completely normal because I think we do a lot of goal setting when it comes to our career and our jobs and our relationship. But sometimes when it comes to our finances, I know for me, I had never set a financial goal um, or I'd been like, yeah, I want to buy a house at some point, but I hadn't put a dollar figure on it and I hadn't put a time frame, and I hadn't worked back to how much that meant I needed to be putting across the savings. So we're just going to give you another 30 seconds. Lise, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think when, because doing, when I sit down with clients, the first thing that we go through is their goals. And I think it catches people off guard, really, because I think they think they're coming in to tell me about their money. But actually, what I'm really interested in their goals, because the goals give a perspective on the financial situation. And what and often because I've caught people off guard, I think they tell me what I, what 
what I want to hear with their goals. They perhaps would tell me um, what, I suppose, maybe what feels right with society. But I think the most liberating thing about these goals, they've got to be, what do you actually really, really want? Is it you want to go and live on a beach at, from age 45 and have a, an internet business that you can do from your laptop? But at the moment, you're currently employed and don't know how you're going to get there. The how you get there will come. I think you've got to set up your dream life really into these got these short medium term and long term goals and if some of them even just seem really crazy like they're never ever going to happen still write them down because i think even the craziest dreams uh, will happen i had a client uh, my favorite this was my favorite goal setting exercise actually was in january and the client um set really normal boring goals and i was like come on there's got to be more to it than that she's like okay the thing i've got in my head is i'd really like to stop my job and I'd like to own a junk shop. <laughs> and we we cash flowed it, we put it in place so that in, I think it was six or seven years time that that was gonna be possible. Amazing, and we're getting some great questions coming through. Amy shared her goals with us. She said, set up emergency fund, pay myself um, 20%, retire um, in my 60s. Um, great, Amy, so just put some, let's put some dollars, um, some pound signs and some dates on that, but there's some really great, um, uh, questions coming through. Um, we've also got quite a few questions on debt coming through. So, you know, in Ladies Finance Club, we have a whole module on debt to help you um, tackle your debt and answer your debt problems. And I think also with women, like, you know, personal finance is personal. It's going to, what your goals are, are going to be very different from what other people's goals are. You know, you might be saving for IVF, you might be saving for a baby, you might be saving for a puppy, you know, no matter what your goals are. Um, you know, it's they're, they're your goals and they're personal to you. Lisa, okay. cash ain't always king, is it? <laughs> no, and I think when I sit down with people, they either have way too much cash or way too little. I never see anyone with that perfect balance. Um, so let's say you had ten thousand pounds in 1995, and your options could be you left it under the mattress. I know when my granddad died, I was under firm instructions to find his money in the cushions in his settee so the equivalent of that um cash in the bank um sat in a savings account or you invest it so if we then fast forward this this research has come to us via um vanguard um, between may 1995 and um, april 2020 so if you then fast forward to today what would we have so under the mattress, you'd still have that 10,000. But the thing that's really important that everyone understands is that 10,000 pounds today could buy you so much less than it would have done in 1995. 1995, 10,000 was a huge amount of money, a lot more, a lot more money than it is today. And we're going to show you some figures on that coming up. 30,000 pounds cash in the bank or 75,000 if you'd have invested again um, in this particular fund. But it just gives you an idea um, of how um, how things will perform. And obviously compliance would always make us say past performance doesn't predict future performance. So. Okay, compounding returns. So Albert Einstein once said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. She who understands it earns it, she who doesn't pays it. He actually said he, but we changed it to she because come on, hashtag 21st century. Okay, so would you rather A, a chessboard with one pence on it that doubles on each square for the whole amount of the chessboard? And I think chessboard is eight by eight, so 64 squares. Or would you rather a million pounds a day for a month? So we've got, so hit us up. We've got some A's coming through, a couple of B's, some A's. Great, couple of B's. All right, let's look at this. Okay, so if you'd chosen B, you would have $30 million. And if you had chosen A, you would have a number that I can't even say because it's trillions of trillions. So isn't that crazy? And this, I guess, is a basic concept of how compounding works. And this is why we love investing. So compounding is when your money is making money. So by reinvesting the income from shares into more shares, you're allowing your initial money to grow. Um, and so let's say we start with 100 pounds 
and we times that by 10%, we've got 110 pounds. But the next year, we're not starting with 100 pounds, we're starting with 110 pounds. And we're timesing that by another 10%. So now we have um, 121 pounds. Um, and you can see how over time, this just takes off. So to show an example of this, um, we've got Molly and Lisa, both 30, hashtag, um, Give us an age discount. And we, um, so I'm earning, um, I put 12,000 pounds away every year for my whole 30s. So I've invested a total of $120,000. So 12K away for, for every year of my 30s. Lisa, she went to Europe, she partied a bit, she got started investing a little bit later. So she invested 12,000. Um, per year, every year of her 40s and 50s. So she's invested a total of 240,000. So she's got double the investment that Molly has, but Molly started in her 30s, Lisa started in her 40s and 50s. Both have a return of 6%. Who do we think has more money, Molly or Lisa? Great, we're seeing some good answers come through. Ah, oh, everyone's so smart, Lisa. They're all getting it right. Molly, so um, she's almost $34,000 in front of Lisa um, because she started earlier. And Lisa's money will never be able to match to Molly's because by that stage, hers is already using the power of that compounding. Lise. So I really wanted to show this chart for lots of reasons. Really, I wanted to show you the difference as I was talking about earlier between getting a different percentage and literally every percent counts. So here, if we start at the beginning, if I invested a hundred pounds a month for five years at 5%, I would walk away with 6,800 pounds. However, if I did the same thing, again, only over five years, but got 7%, I'd get that little bit more. So 7,100, it's not that exciting. However, if you fast forward and you look, well, what if I make that term 30 years? So over 30 years at 5%, I would have 81,000, but over at 7%, I would have 117,000. So almost 50% more just by getting 2% extra a year. And you can see the power of compounding across this table. So after 10 years, I've just got 2,000 pounds more. After 20 years, I've got 10,000 pounds more. But after 30 years, I've got nearly 40,000 pounds more. So the longer you leave it, the, the better return that you can get. Obviously, you're going to be getting a return in line with your attitude to risk. But it's really important to make sure that we're investing for as long as possible. And we're taking a really, really, really long view on it. I've just seen a question is about how likely is it to get um, in um, a 6% return. So it depends on your attitude to risk. I'd say a balanced client over the last five years has achieved that easily. Um, perhaps even a conservative client, a cautious client probably hasn't. Um, and in the current climate, people actually think we're in a bad situation, but most of my clients' portfolios probably had recovered by July, August at, at worst. And when I was looking at a balanced client portfolio over the last year today, they were up 4%. So it seems like we've had a bad time, but actually the markets have responded really well, especially in the last couple of months. And you're finding that even clients, given that we've had this coronavirus, are still up 3 4% on the year. And just so you know, ladies, we're getting questions in about every 10 seconds. So we are seeing them and we will get to as many as we can. Um, but we're going to tell you a little bit more about our club at the end, which is where you can get all these questions answered. I just really wanted to touch on this one because it's one we hear a lot, um, Lisa. Um, Caroline said, look, I'm nearly 50. Is it too late for me to use the power of compounding and start investing? No, the answer is definitely not. It, it's just not going to be as powerful as if you were 21. But at the same rate, it's going to be a lot more um, beneficial than if you wait till you're 55. Um, so you, and, and also, I think we can overthink it. We've just got to get going with a financial plan. Um, even if it's small, you can always gradually increase it. So often people put it off because they think, oh, I don't have the money. Um, but I think if you, start as soon as you can with whatever you have, I think is the answer.
And, and if we just run past the next two slides, Molly, because these ones just show the difference of investing more. And I've just put these in out of interest because I know some people will feel they can only invest £100, maybe even less every month. But some people, I know our audience has a real wide um, earnings potential. So some people may be doing this is for 500 a month. Again, you can see over 30 years, 5% at 400, 7% nearly at 600. And then I put the next one in. I know there's not, not many people that can um, invest a thousand pounds a month, but I wanted to put that in there because it shows you the million. And I think that was linked back to one of those goals. Um, by investing for 30 years, a thousand pounds a month at 7%, 1.176 um, um, million in the bank, which is nice, <laughs> which we all want to aim for. Okay. Uh -huh. So um, inflation. So yeah, we're not talking about inflatables. We're talking about inflation. <laughs> and I think a lot of people struggle with inflation, but it's a really, really important concept to get. And this is if people understand the power of inflation, it's almost like reverse compounding. It has a negative impact on the value of your um, money. Um, and I think that if when you understand in, um, the power of the negative power of inflation, you'll stop keeping money and focusing on keeping your money in cash. So this is how my mind works. I remember in the 1980s, I was born in 1981, um, a packet of polos in my mind always cost 10 P. Um, and I would be weighing up, will I get a 10 P mix or will I get a packet of polos? Weirdly, I always chose the polos. I don't know what's wrong with me. But now a packet of polos is 65p. Well, 60p on Tesco's, 65p on other web websites. Um, but it costs 600% more um, than when I was little. And that's inflation. It's the, the cost of one thing, the same thing. Nothing's changed, but, but the price has gone up over time. And the government have a basket of goods and services that they monitor um, every year to um, work out what inflation is. Um, and there are two measures of inflation. If you want to get geeky, there's the retail price index, RPI, and there's CPI, the, um, um, sorry, and CPI. The difference between the two is mortgage interest. Um, and a lot of people also don't understand, they hear about inflation. So I've just explained what that is, but also they hear about interest rates, especially at the moment. So interest rates have been slashed to 0.1%. So this is the rate that the Bank of England, um, the Bank of England base rate right now. The Bank of England base rate determines what interest rate you're going to get on your cash savings. It determines what interest you're going to pay on your mortgage, on your loans, on, on any debt as, well, debt as well. So when you can, if you're in an, a situation where you've got high inflation, and low interest rates, it's going to be really, really hard for your money to keep pace and to be able to buy the same basket of goods as the next year. Okay. So the very, very best um, savings accounts right now I, um, I do a, a weekly instagram on it but um 0.7 is the very best savings rate and you're going to find that at the moment with the likes of saga um it slipped my mind saga definitely um I'll, it'll come to me in a minute the other one um interest rate so it, a bit of historical perspective in the, the um, interest rates were 17 percent in the 80s and now they're almost zero so so it's fallen hugely and we're becoming very accustomed to not paying very much when it comes to interest on mortgages, loans, credit cards. So now is a, is a good time if you're a mortgage payer because your interest rate is likely to be low and low in and, and extremely low in comparison um, to historical figures. But it's a terrible time to be a saver because money in the bank just isn't earning you anything. If you if you're lazy with your your cash accounts, most bank accounts are charged are, are going to be giving you less than 0.1 percent a year, um, and that's definitely not beating inflation. The government have a target of to keep inflation at around two percent to give a bit of perspective. Asset classes. So um, someone just asked. Um, earlier she said um oh where did it go oh sorry I've lost it but oh yeah she goes what what are you talking about when you're talking about investing are you talking about shares or stocks so uh, shares and stocks are the same thing and we're going to cover this in asset classes so this is 
what you can invest in. So we've got cash, which we're all familiar with, but we've just heard the interest rates aren't great. Um, we've got bonds. So I always like to think of bonds as an IOU. So I'm loaning money. And Lise, am I right with saying with corporate bonds, with government corporate bonds, it's the people loaning the government money and we get paid a small interest um, return on that. Exactly. So um, you get two types of bonds. There's government bonds, which are sometimes called gilts, and you get corporate bonds. And the reason governments and um, companies go out and um, issue bonds is because usually it's a cheap way for them to borrow money. Um, and it's a, it's a way that they can control the way that they borrow money as well. And we hold it. Oh, sorry. So they will pay you a percentage every year, usually a very low percentage every year, which is just the income. And in return, they will give you your money back at the end. Great. And then um, so cash and bonds, these are called defensive assets because they're going to defend your portfolio. Um, and, and then can we I interrupt? They're not premium bonds. Premium bonds are a cash like thing. Um, they're a different way of saving. And I talk about them all the time on Instagram. So look at that but yeah they're not premium bonds and then we've got our growth asset classes which is property so you guys will all be familiar with property um owning owning um homes uh there's also kind of commercial property as well where you can own parts of car parts or airports things like that and then there's also shares as well um shares um are referred to as stocks equities um there's a couple of names to them um, and we're going to probably really be focusing on mainly shares today. So that is the asset classes so that where there are other asset classes, but these are the main ones and the main ones we're going to be looking at today. All right, over to you for returns, please. Um, and also just on, on this. Um, so the reason why when we're building a portfolio for clients, we want to have a mix of all of these different asset classes, plus others out there. I mean, we're keeping this very simple for today. But the reason you want to have different asset classes is it helps to diversify. So when one thing's going up, maybe another thing's going down. And the way that you make money, so on um, on cash, you're getting interest. On property, you will make money by getting some rent, but also um, hopefully the value of that property goes up over time. I know we're having a bit of a boom in the residential, but not necessarily in the commercial markets at the moment. Um, when it comes to shares, so shares are just a little part, a percentage of a company. So when you own a share in a company, you own a little bit of that company and that company will pay dividends. So this is almost like the rent. This is the, this is the amount that the company will pay to shareholders to keep them happy every year. But also you hope the value of the company goes up in time as well. Maybe they will invent something. Maybe they'll get the coronavirus injection. Maybe they'll merge and their value will then go up. So you hope to get two streams of income. You get, when you invest, you get accumulation shares and you get income shares. Income shares pay the money out to you. Accumulation shares reinvest that money um, back into the investment. Okay, and just to quickly and reemphasize, so a share is when you buy a share in a company. So you become really a part, a very small one, um, but you become a very small shareholder in that in that company. So for example. If there's a company, let's say um, you're loving renewables and you want to buy into Tesla and you buy um, 100 shares in Tesla, you're then a part shareholder of Tesla. And that is just an example. That is not a recommendation. <laughs> All right. And then this is just to give you an example and a bit of perspective on how these different things work. We couldn't get a cash rate to go back 30 years, but I've put here CPI, which is inflation. So for your money to, to be worth the same over the over a 30 year period, you would need to get a 90% return over the last year, 0.74%. UK gilt, so over 30 years, 682%, 4% in the last year, which is a good year for bonds. Um, world equities, over a thousand percent, it's just insane over 30 years. Again, that really, really is the power of um, return of, of long term investing 4.45% over the last year. So this is probably where most people will be surprised that over the last year, if you've been invested in equities, um, in world equities, you would have made money. A world equity is just a, um, how have all the companies that are listed in the world 
performed and, and you invest in those those markets on average you would have made 4.45 percent and the FTSE 100 is the UK so that is only invested in the top 100 UK companies over the last 30 years you would have made 821 percent but over the last year, we we, we we you would have made a loss over a one year period, eighteen percent over the last year. Um, so, and I'm seeing a lot worrying at the moment. A lot of people have got their pensions too highly focused on the UK, um, and we definitely, definitely don't want that at the moment. Um, but never have we um, wanted to have a UK um, focus um, when it comes to investing. So I can see um, some questions coming up around well. What are world equities? You know, how do you invest in the FTSE 100? We will cover that later. Um, but there is what there are ways where you can invest in world equities, the FTSE 100, and um, it's very simple and um, it's kind of all done for you. So you buy an exchange traded fund or an ETF or a fund, which we'll cover a little bit later, um, and then you get exposure to that whole um, index. But if we will cover this later. So if you're a bit worried, don't worry, stay with us. So we've got a quick recap. So we've got compounding returns. This is when your money is making money and this is why we invest. Um, and as Lisa said as well, we're not just talking here about your own investing in stocks and shares. This, is, this applies to your pension as well because your own pension is invested um, into the share market as well. Um, inflation, um, asset classes, we had cash, shares, bonds, and property. A little rhyme for you um, is shares, you're an owner, bonds, you're a loner. So if you're trying to remember what the difference is, shares, you're an owner, bonds, you're a loner, and return. So this is what you get back from your investments. All right, risks, Lisa. So it, over a long time, we've seen that you're taking a risk by investing can be rewarded. Um, and the more risk you take, typically, the more return you can expect. Um, and I think, well, as you can see here, the risk return graph, but what's really important to get across is you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket, which we're going to come to in a second. So if we go to the next slide, that might help a little bit. When, when we're investing, you've got to accept this volatility. So you can see that drop off the cliff um, there at the end. That is um, the coronavirus. This graph only goes up until the 1st of March, 2020. So it looks terrible. And when you're on that path downwards, it feels horrendous as well. But what you've got to remember is that you need to stick with it because selling low you don't want to be buying high and selling low, which is what we're conditioned to do. It's a surefire way of losing money. Actually, what's happened now, um, most clients' portfolios have recovered. Well, as I said, most clients' portfolios are recovered by the end of the summer. So there would have then been another tick off. But we've kept this like this because I wanted to show you the pain that it can feel like when you're investing with a short time horizon. If you look back here, the 2007, 2008 here, so 2008 here, you'll see this is a credit crunch. The credit crunch felt a huge deal at the time, um, but it looks pretty painless with, um, the high, with a bit of perspective and hindsight on that graph. So you've got to accept these ups and downs um, and the amount of risk you take, the more volatility you would expect. So you've got to do a lot of work into making sure you're matching the right investment with you because you don't want to be having sleepless nights. One person's cautious is not another person's cautious. And I just want to point out here as well, this is why women make really good investors because we have a plan and we stick to it. So if we took a look at the example here of the GFC, had, um, had we seen what was happening, freaked out and sold, um, we would have lost out on all the gains that would have happened over the next um, year and two years um, and then it, and, and would have seen it recover. So it's important again, and this is why we say when it comes to your short-term goals, we keep it in cash because if something like this did happen and there was a drop, then you wouldn't have time for the market to recover. But because you are in the market for the long term, um, you would have plenty of time for that to recover. Um, so that is why we really say keep short-term goals in cash. 
And history shows that investing in the stock market offers the best returns over the long term. And you can see that it is not a smooth sailing line. It is going to be a bit of a rocky roller coaster. But overall, as we saw, history shows that that investing in the stock market offers the best returns over the long term. Risk profile. Yeah. So we, we, as I said, we've got to get the right risk profile for you, for, for you to make sure that when markets fall, you're falling by an amount that's not going to keep you awake at night. So it balances risk and return to make sure that, well, to make sure that you're not worrying. So typically most places will um, divide you clients into four, five, six different um, groups. So we've got conservative, balanced, growth and high growth. And here you can see we've just summarized how you would normally split this between um, those defensive, so that is cash and bonds um, versus growth. So that is the um, stocks and shares and the property. So the more risky you are, the more growth um, focused investments you're going to have. But also the more growth focused um, assets that you're going to have, um, the more volatility you will have to accept. And this is my version of that. So when I think of a risk profile, I think of it as in shoes. So you've got your conservative. Um, so you know you're going to get home after a night out. Um, so you've got more um, of the, the cash and bonds than the, the, um, the stocks and property. Um, balanced. So that's like a nice little winter boot. So it's still pretty, you're still feeling pretty good. Um, when you get into growth and high growth, that's where we're getting into kind of wedge and stiletto territory. High growth stiletto, um, you know, if you can pull it off, it's going to be great. Um, there is a chance you might break your ankle. Um, so, you know, uh, that is my version of the slides. <laughs> Concept seven, asset allocation and diversification. Lisa. So when, when it comes to investing, so for example, Molly, the, the analogy that you said earlier about investing in Tesla. So you put your money in Tesla over the short term, you might be really, really pleased. But if over the medium term Tesla goes bust, you've lost absolutely everything you ever had invested. So we want you to be well diversified. We want your money in lots of different asset classes. We want your money in lots of different industries so that you're well diversified. If one industry is hit, whoever thought that this would happen to the wedding industry, to um, the hospitality industry. Um, we also want you to have different time horizons for your investments, because if you've got a long term horizon, say for your pension versus your, say, your medium term pot, which is your ISA, you're going to have different levels of risk for that. And you also want different assets around the world. So when one economy is doing well, one necessary, one might not necessarily be doing so well. Um, you want to just spread your risk. So as you can see, all your eggs aren't in one basket. I like that picture of the pink egg. Well, <laughs> and if you're thinking, but how do I know what the best, you know, how to device, diversify it or what German supermarkets going well, what Japanese bank I should be in? Um, you don't have to know. There's ways around this. So and we're going to cover that shortly. Um, so let's quickly recap. So we've got compounding returns. We've got inflation, asset classes, return. We've got risk. So this is a chance you will not um, make a, uh, a gain um, and you might make a loss. Um, you've got risk profile, so that balances how comfortable you are with your goals. And this is going to differ person to person. I have a twin sister and um, her risk profile is very different to mine because she is a lot more conservative because that's just how she is. I feel a little bit more confident, so I always go a little bit more risky. So it's going to be different um, depending on even personality types. Um, and asset allocation diversification. So this is the mix of assets and diversification, not putting all your eggs in one basket, but putting lots of eggs in lots of baskets. So if one basket drops, you don't lose all your eggs. All right, Lisa, active versus passive investing. When it comes to investing, and this is a real broad brush stroke, there are, there are two categories of, of types of investing. There are active investing um, and there are passive investing. Active investing is where you have, and is the, I suppose it's the more traditional way of investing, the way that people would think. You, you give your money to a fund manager. A fund manager is somebody who will invest your money in lots and lots of different stocks and shares. They will spread it around. They're making the decision, shall I buy this and sell that on a daily basis, monthly basis, whatever it is. And they are supported by a team of analysts 
who are all really, really well paid usually. So when it comes to active money, um, it, it usually is quite expensive in the way that the, um, the money is run. So it's not a cheap way to invest. Um, but the lovers of active management will say, because you've got that skill, because you've got that knowledge and that research um, capacity, we're going to outperform the market. And out of that outperformance of the market, we justify our fees, but we make you better off as an investor. Now, when it comes, like with anything, there are good, medium and bad. And it's exactly the same with active investors. So I use a lot of active investment portfolios for clients, um, but we have to get it right. We have to know that that, that active manager is earning their fee by adding extra to the portfolio. And if you want to put your fund manager um, to the test, you can look at a website called Trustnet. So look at trustnet.com and in the Google bar, so you don't have to search the whole um, Trustnet website, put Trustnet and the name of the investment that you're in and press go. And it should then bring up um, a fact sheet and it will show you in a graph at the top the first one line will be you, one line will be the average. So you want to know, are, you, are they outperforming the average? Um, if you scroll down, then you can see a lot more about how well diversified they are, what their top 10 holdings are. You can see a picture of them if you want to as well. There's so much information on there. Um, a passive investing is where you track the market. So if the market goes up, you go up. If the market goes down, you go down. You don't need a human to do that for you. It's more computer driven. And so... As a result, these, um, this is a very, very cheap way of investing. And I usually incorporate that into a lot of my clients' portfolios because it helps bring the cost down. If you're just starting out, then maybe passive is exactly what you want mm. to be doing because passive is it's controlling the, the, the fees for you whilst the pot is small. And then as your pot grows, you can then start to um, branch out and maybe use a combination of the two and incorporate um, some active managers as well. Um, People who love passive investments would say um, no active manager can continually have good ideas um, and their fees are a drag on performance. So I'm just going to track the market. Um, but as I say, when you go down, as my, when markets go down, you go down as well. And when you say track the market, Lisa, so um, you can buy these exchange traded funds. So, um, so when your money pulls together with lots of other people's money and it's invested in um, such as when you mentioned then maybe like the top 200 companies in the country or the top X countries in the world. But you can also have these in different sectors and um, in a, a whole range of different funds, can't you? Yeah, they come in almost every flavor you could imagine. But again, like we keep saying, you don't need to worry about, oh my God, where do I even pick these, um, these passive investments or active investments? We're going to show you at the moment, um, soon the top, the, the top 10 places, not, uh, not according to us, but we're going to show you some other places um, and they will have model portfolios where you can go into and they've done that work for you. So when it comes to actually buying investments, um, this is something that I feel gets overcomplicated, but I always like to think of it as buying on eBay. So if you can buy on eBay, you can definitely buy um, shares. So with eBay, you open an account, you find the dress you want or find the item you want, you put in your price um, and then it is accepted and you get a confirmation and then you get the dress sent to you. You know, with investing, it's not a huge, it's not hugely different. So you know, step one is you have to open um, open a wrapper. And we would say here where, because we a lot of you have said you're beginners, um, we, uh, well, we're not suggesting, but you, you might want to think about something like a stocks and shares ISA opening one of those because they've got some great tax benefits. Um, number two is you've got to select your, your funds. Um, so as mentioned before, um, funds are, instead of buying one company, you're buying a range of companies and you can buy these ethic, ethical investments. You can buy um, different countries. You can buy different sectors. You can focus on technology. You can focus on pharmaceutical. You can focus on so many, as Lisa said, there's like all the flavors of the rainbow. Um, you can decide how much you want to invest and set your limits. So you might say, okay, I have 500 pounds every month I want to invest, or I have 50 pounds that I want to invest every month. 
um, you deposit that money, you set and set up a direct debit, and then you know you put that order through and you get confirmation and you're an investor. And it's Can I just easy. add a bit in just to answer the questions that are coming through? So um, when you invest, you go through some of these providers that everybody's talking through on the chat, you go through to them and you can decide whether or not to use the ISA. All the ISA is, is a, is a tax wrapper around it. So when investments grow in value, the government wants to tax you. So if you put it in an ISA, the, the ISA protection protects that money from tax. And the government doesn't just want to give away loads of tax-free money. So it only allows you to pay £20,000 a year per person into a stocks and shares ISA or any ISA. You can split them and have, say, 5000 in a cash ISA and 15000 in stocks and shares ISA. But the first thing is you want to make sure that you are... Um, you want to make sure that you're using that ISA allowance if, you, if you're not using it already. And no, you don't have to set up a direct debit. So you can do um, lump sums if you want. Um, but if you want to be investing regularly, um, a direct debit is a great way to do that because um, you then uh, it, it dollar costs average your investment. So um, if you've got a thousand pounds and you invest all on one day, um, the stock market might be it might be up, it might be low. Um, but if you invest that thousand dollars and you do a hundred over, let's say two weeks, um, if the market goes up and down, you're going to be getting those highs, those lows. And that's why we call it dollar cost averaging because it will average out the price over time. All right. So here are, again, these are not recommendations, but these are ones that um, Boring Money and the Times Money Mentor have um, written about on their website as being um, good places to look for opening um, stocks and shares. So some here are such as Nutmeg, they're robo advisors. So you open it on your phone. They're going to ask you some questions about your risk level. What are your goals? How comfortable are you with that risk? And then they're going to put, they will have options of where you can invest that money and they will have already diversified that for you. Um, so as we mentioned before, with the defensive and the growth, they'll already have that packaged up um, for you in, um, in, an, in, in a very simple, easy to um, buy. And if you can do click, click, uh, there's also Wealth Simple as well. Um, there's also other names here you might've heard of, Fidelity, Vanguard, AJ Bell, Hasgraves Lansdowne who also offer these. Um, and these were the ones, again, that Boring Money and Time Money Mentor had on their website. So as mentioned, then you select your funds, you decide how much you want to invest, you deposit your money, and then you're an investor. And obviously we only have an hour with you tonight. There is so much, and we are just literally scratching the surface here. Um, but we did not want we did want to give you, you know, some information and some tools that you can apply um, to your own investing knowledge. So kind of just the six steps to get you ready. So you want to review your finances, write down your goals, make sure all that debt's paid off, that bad debt's paid off first, understand your risk, research your investment options, build your portfolio and monitor your investments. So we had so many questions come through, Lisa. Um, but before we might, we might answer some of those questions a little bit at the end. Yeah, let's do those again. Yeah, because we're really excited because we're actually launching our club. So Lisa and I, we... We speak to women all the time about money and we wanted to create a community and a space where, you know, women could come together and we could learn this information together and regularly. Um, because there, as, as mentioned, there is a lot of jargon out there and there's so much information. And when you're trying to work out what to do, um, it can be really hard to do by yourself. So, um, you know, Lisa, you, how, how long... How much time do you spend learning about finance, like every month? Well, I, if my compliance team are watching, I have to. Um, I have to do 35 hours a year learning. But actually, I would say more like an hour and a half, two hours a day of learning. And the, the more you learn, the more there is to learn. I think you never stop. And I think that's why I wanted to be involved in Ladies Finance Club, because all of that 17 years of me geeking up on money, I wanted to be able to offer the, the edited highlights to people so without having to pay for um full-blown advice 
Yeah, absolutely. So we get Lisa's knowledge and she breaks it down for us. And, you know, at Ladies Finance Club, we definitely say we don't dumb it down. We just break it down. So in our club um, and in our, in our pink level, um, you get monthly masterclasses with amazing um, international and UK leading financial experts. And this really does have a big, um, a big pivot towards investing. Um, there's tribe account accountability check-in sessions. We've been running um, this club in Australia and these check-in sessions are incredible. It's been amazing to see women go from, I have no idea where to start with my money to, um, you know, a couple of months later saying, these are my goals. I'm investing for the first time and I'm on my way um, to financial freedom. And it's so, it's, I'm, I'm so proud of them and it's so exciting to see their progression so quickly once they've got those things set up. So we have these tribe accountability check-in sessions where we go through your goals and we keep you accountable to those goals. Um, Cause it's always easier with a bit of peer pressure and a bit of gal pals. So, hey, <laughs> why not? Um, we have a fierce financial um, course. So this is about fast tracking your money, your, your money success. Um, so we cover all the basics. So Lisa, um, it's, we cover debt, we cover setting up an emergency fund, we cover insurance, we cover um, earnings, pensions. budgeting, cash flow, pensions. And we've seen a lot of questions tonight about pensions. So Lisa goes through pensions. We'll also be running monthly masterclass sessions on our pensions. And you'll also get access to our um, library, which has past, um, past videos that we have done on pensions and investing. This video will be on there. There'll be a whole range of videos. Um, in our pink um, club, they will also get a 30 minute insurance review. So um, just really quickly, Lise, um, with insurance, I know you're very passionate about income protection insurance. Yeah, I think, well, I think it's really important that we all have a safety net and um, a lot of people are covered by their work, but if you're not covered by your work, it's best you find out now rather than when you need it. Um, and I just think it's nice to have that safety net so that if something goes wrong, you're not relying on your investments to, to prop you up for, um, well, when life goes a bit wrong, those, those investments are still there for the good stuff and the fun stuff that, that they were earmarked for. Great. Um, we also have fill in the blank template. So we've got our goal template. We've got our expense trackers, um, budgets um, already there for you to download and to action. Um, we have, we're really excited. So we're launching our mobile magazine where we um, have spoken to some incredible women um, interviewed uh, with leading business women we've got top articles lisa has broken down a whole range of financial topics so this will hit your um, hit your inbox every month so it's just a really another really great way to keep up and keep learning and keep yourself um, engaged so that is our pink club um, and then we have our diamond package. So this also includes side hustle sessions. So, you know, if you've got an idea that you want to potentially turn into a business while remaining fully employed, um, we have this. So there's some great sessions on how to start an online, how to build an online course. If you know nothing about building an online course, um, we've got how to start your own podcast for under a hundred pounds. Um, we've got tips and tools from experts, how to um, test out an idea and see if there's an audience for it. So I love these sessions. So these um, are once every every two months with um, a different expert. We also have an economics 101. Um, so if you missed out on economics 101 at school, like I did, um, these are great sessions because we um, get economists and investment um, experts to come in and give us an update and help teach us and um, educate us about the economy and what we need to know and what what do all the, the what does the jargon mean and what are the stats about um, and what are the investment trends we should be aware of so that again is um, a bi-monthly um, webinar um, we also wanted to give you as much value as possible um, because your success, as cliche as it sounds, is our success. And we are passionate about helping women take control of their financial future so they can live a life, um, you know, that they choose. They never feel that they're trapped in the situation. So we've also included monthly book summaries. So um, we have read a whole bunch of different books and we've summarized them. So hey, you've got time to read all those books. So um, yeah, we've done the hard work there for you and they'll hit your um, account once every month. 
And we've also um, on Pink and Diamond, you get access, as I said, to our members only website where there's community, there's a forum, you can ask your questions. So there's lots, if you've got questions about pensions, if you have a burning question about investments, that's where you go and that's where you can get answers. So really quickly, we've got our magazine and that is a fiver a month. So if you wanna, if you wanna start educating yourself but you don't think you're ready for a pink or diamond, um, that one's just a fiver. Um, with our pink, it's 35 a month or 420. And that again, gives you access to the course, the masterclasses, um, access to our members on the website, those tribe accountability sessions, or we've got our diamond, which is 57. And that's where you get those economics 101 and the side hustle sessions as well. We are going to do a special because it is our launch and, you know, we are so excited to get people as our founding members. Um, and so this is starting off at, um, you can save 20%. So it will be 336 when you buy for an annual amount and 547 and 20 pence when you buy it as an annual amount as the diamond. Um, you know, this was the best way that we thought we can help you succeed with your finances um, is to create a community where we can all come together. So I'm just going to stick these links in the chat now. So you can head over there and um, yeah, but, uh, head over there and um, actually let me put this one in as well and get that. Lisa, I'm just going to stick the, um, the links in. Yeah. Do you have Stop going through the questions? Yes, please. That would be great. So um, there's, there's lots of questions about what do we think about certain providers and things like that. I'm really sorry, and I know it's frustrating. We just can't give advice on those things. Um, we could give advice if you wanted one-to-one -one advice, but it's all very personal. Um, so Kate asks that roughly what size would you say is the time to move from passive to active? Again, this is really, really personal, but um, I can't see a huge need um, to switch to um, an active unless you had some you had some specific criteria until you've got tens of thousands in the pot, um, maybe even more. Um, can you renegotiate your fees when your funds are bought online? No, you can't negotiate your fees. Advisors can negotiate fees on behalf of you, but um, essentially you negotiate your fees by shopping around and you, by comparing the fees um, that, you, um, that you choose to buy. I need to change my mindset. So hard to think in the long term, but got to do it. So I think that's a really important thing. Money mindset is something that I work a lot on. Um, well, we do a lot of work mm. on it in the Ladies Finance Club. And I would say the key thing when thinking about your money mindset is cast your mind back to when you were age seven. What was your family environment like when it came to money? That usually is a key, a key signifier of where your money beliefs come from. Also, you can have a think because it's often hard to be honest with yourself, really. But how do you react when the bills come through the door? Do you open them, file them, deal with them, shred them as you should? Or do they sit there? Do you get notices? Is there a system? Are you organized? If, um, how would you answer the question? If money came to tea or money came to a party, I loved it when we asked this one, Molly, at the Albright Club this, well, so this January has gone very fast. But anyway, yeah. how would, um, how, if money came to tea or if money came um, to a party, describe them and really interestingly for me I always thought money would be the life and soul of the party money would definitely be a fun person but overwhelmingly the audience of probably a hundred people or so felt it would be a grey um, a person dressed in grey it would be boring it would be the party pooper and they're key indications that your money mindset needs to work on um, work on and there's so many books out there that can help you and obviously all the resources that we put out there will help um, let me see, keep going down. I'll do as many as I can. Um, if I, here we go. Oh, sorry. Um, oh. Lots of questions on, is it too late? Definitely not too late. Even if you're five minutes before retirement, um, you still need a plan and you need to um, start saving. Um, do you get compound interest on LISA? So compound interest, interest is something that is, um, Compound interest is something that is attached to cash. Anything with the word interest is cash-like. Compounding returns, that's when it comes to investing. But so if you've got an investment LISA, you'll get compound returns. If you've got a compound, um, if you've got a cash LISA, then you'll get compound returns. We might just do one more question, Lise. 
not how do you balance the all of these needs so they've got a lady here who wants a house she needs to retire um and she wants and she wants to have a baby or maybe she's on maternity leave you've got to prioritize them so you've got to do the little bits right so you definitely need to be in your work pension you definitely need to be getting the most out of your employer do you need to be overpaying and really focusing on the pension right now probably not you want to be focusing on as a hierarchy you want to do your short-term cash savings so you start the pension you focus on your debt you build up your cash savings you build up your emergency fund then you start to um, then do your monthly investing so for your medium term pot and then you start to overpay everything and maybe overpay the mortgage as well if, you, if your mortgage say you've got a mortgage that will run until you're 65 you want to get that mortgage to run until you're 60 by overpaying but not until you've done all the right things in all of your pots um so thank you so much everyone for joining us thank you for your lovely feedback that's been coming through we're really glad you enjoyed it and we hope you got something out of it we would love to see you in our tribe we have a 20 percent um uh launch coupon which we will include we'll also include it in the follow-up email um oh great we're so glad it's been informative fantastic awesome thanks becky karen thanks rita jen rach thank you so much and we hope to see you in the tribe we would love to have you as part of our community see you all soon